It's also people need to step up and at some point recognize that the world that we live in, going to be living in the next 20, 30 years with climate change, with artificial intelligence, with uh, geopolitical changes that are so very, very rapidly, radically viewing our structure of the world from the last 100 years. What does that look like? So I think this is people are really going to have to start stepping up and the old ways may have relevance, but where are the trade-offs in that? It's going to be pretty important for people to think through. But we need if they think through that, we need to be able to encourage that and give people the space to experiment. And so I love this emphasis on the microcosm, the instructor, the classroom experience, again, whatever that classroom looks like in terms of hybridity. I want to I want to just pull on that thread because I think having I'm going to also um, out myself having been an employee of yours many years ago, um, I have attended professional development sessions that you have led, and I and I've told you this multiple times that I I always felt that they were inspiring and it was something that I enjoyed doing, motivating, and I think this that you know that was pre a lot of the world disruptions and burnout things and wellness issues that many people are facing these days though. How do you, this is a huge thing that comes up a lot when we talk uh, about the evolution of, uh, the evolution and revolutions happening in education. Um, revolutions take time, they take perseverance. Uh, they take that kind of sustainable grit. And instructors who are arguably, you know, as I work in the continuing ed sector as well, not, not underpaid, but <laughs> um, not paid amazingly for some of the work that they're doing. And a lot feel they're they're not compensated fairly in in many different sectors, instructors across undergraduate and continuing studies areas. But so there's a level of feeling devalued, underappreciated, overworked, overburdened, especially with a lot of these technology things, right? People are saying, a lot of instructors or teachers in the field are saying, you expect me to do so much. You're expecting me to experiment. You're expecting me to pivot. You're expecting me to integrate all this emergent technology, understand how it's valuable in education. And for many of them, they've never even done a degree in teaching, right? For a yeah. lot of them, they're subject matter experts. They're not in it because necessarily they love and have studied uh, teaching. So how have you approached? I'm not saying you have to have the answer, Stephen. <laughs> you don't need to provide the golden uh, ticket here. But I think it's important to get people's insights. How are you managing uptake in professional development, sustainable engagement of professionals working in the field within learning and being part of a community of practice? Because as you say, I like that emphasis. It comes down to the operationalization uh, and 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 human beings stepping up at the instructor level in those classrooms. So I think over my career, I've done a lot of teach training. Um, it's it's okay. This uh, the first thing is to try and make it fun. It's not compliance training. I mean, you might do compliance training now and again. You need to do it. That's fine, right? But try and make the event fun and engaging because people learn better if they're having if it's an enjoyable experience first of all so i believe that's important and that depends how you uh, how you structure that and how the materials that you're choosing to use as well and doing little things like warmers and activities and fun closes and things like that it's all really good pedagogy training should be about the same thing right um but it's also um, finding out where people are. Now, if people, like, there's loads of training out there. A lot of it is free as well. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of it offered for free in Ontario even, whether through eCampus Ontario, through um, uh, the, um, I can't remember the name of the other body, but we'll come back to it. But there's a lot of free training out there, but people have to be aware of it to be able to do it. So one thing I like to try and do and have done over my career is promote and send communications out. Hey, this is really useful. I, I'm aware of this professor who's leading it. It's really interesting, could be useful. So I do things like that. Um, the other thing is that you need to go to where people are. Mm -hmm. So that means having those conversations and the, the water cooler conversations in the organization to find out where people are to what they think they need. And that doesn't just mean the instructors, that means the staff who are helping and supporting that system 
to work efficiently. So what do they, what kind of training do the staff need as well? The ultimate goal is success with the students. Where do we go with that? Mm. And students need some training as well, right? It's not just learning. It's how to organize different things in different ways. I'm a big believer in that. And there's never enough time in curriculum to pay attention to that either, I think, um, to be, you know, successful learners, as it were, and to how to learn to apply those things later. Um, but go to where people are at already and see where you can take them a step further on it and do that in as fun a way and enjoyable way as possible is are the two main mantras I would find for this. Yeah, and it is, it's very true that, you know, I, I tend to, because of my 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 background, I love going to the neurobiological elements of, of what it means to be a homo sapien. And um, neurobiologically, we want to be seen, right? Like we want to be heard. And if, again, that idea of massification, if I'm in a professional development setting and I don't feel like you know me or I matter, um, and you don't take that time to cultivate a sense of community or a sense of belonging, if there's no, you identified it very early on in your own educational career. If there's no social connection, Mm-hmm. Um, and when I think back to the time learning with you, I'm, uh, you know, with your leadership, uh, the staff members were friends, like um, not, not close friends. We, but we, we communicated, we joshed around, there was humor, there was, so there were connections between members of staff that then could help to support the kind of environment you're talking about creating. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to touch on the technology side of things, because I think this point is really important. The role Connection, belonging, uh, relational, uh, social connections, whatever we want to call it. I believe um, networked learning, you know, whatever we want to call it. How are you finding the shift? How are you finding technology useful in that regard? And how are you finding technology challenging in that regard? In the, in, in, in the work that you've seen and the way you've seen in, in instructors maybe take up the mantle for um, creating community and encouraging collaboration in their courses. How are you seeing technology help or hinder that? Okay, great question. So language is important to to people, right? And it has an effect on us in the way, in an unconscious way sometimes. So when you, intro- let's say I was, let's say there's a PD session or or even that you're training to be an instructor or you're doing something like that. As soon as you say technology, that might put the fear into some people. As soon as you say the word innovation, some people think the first place they go, well, that's change. What does that look like? Uh, what does that mean to me? What are the risks associated with it? I think the first thing that's really important that by and large, Almost any technology up to now has not done anything that we've not been able to do as humans already. Mm. First thing to do is completely demystify technology that it is not an alien thing. So the technology itself is doing this thing, perhaps in a more efficient way that's like than it was previously. And it's probably enables better data to make analysis of it. But actually, people were doing this before this technology anyway. So Try to go back to the root purpose of the technology and what it is aiming to achieve. If you can identify that, demystify why it's being implemented that way or why it's been chosen, I think that enables those kind of more realistic human-level conversations about how it's going to work to happen. Mm. demystify like unpack don't assume that innovation actually means innovation because quite often it doesn't at all it just means doing it in a different way it's not doing it in a new way which innovation usually means Mm. um so that's a really important thing with technology and remember again technologies can be pedagogies as well and technology the structure Okay. Let's double click on this one first before you go on to the next one, because I, so let's take a discussion forum. Okay. 
which is like the bane of so many people's existences when they when they implement this in, in their courses. So you have a learning management system, you whatever it is, and you want to have these weekly discussion forums. It's an opportunity for technology to help. We often think it's producing community. They're collaborating. They're communicating with each other in these spaces. But based on what you just said, am I correct in, in assuming that what needs to happen first is an instructor needs to say, what the heck are we using this discussion board <laughs> For like, what is the purpose of this discussion board? And I want to demystify this asynchronous learning management system space that feels technological, which could be off-putting for some of you or cold in some way. And I want to tell you that we need to share our ideas, that we need to we need to build off of each other's ideas. We need to not only share but hear what other people are thinking. And you know, sometimes it takes a minute to think about what you what you are you're feeling and reflect on the content of a course. So a dis the discussion board is like serving as that space where we go away for a minute, you come back and when it works for you, you you share your insights. And then what we are, we're doing is we're we're doing what we would naturally do as human beings, having a conversation, but here's a piece of technology that's affording us more flexibility a greater level of access. Let's say you want to, something hits you and you want to communicate it on a bus on the way home. Well, this technology is affording you that, that opportunity. Is that the kind of first step you're talking about? Yeah, I think there's one aspect that you maybe were touching on, but I would highlight is also, so identify what it is you're exactly trying to do. What's the purpose of it, but also, for the, and that's for you almost to identify because it enables you to provide the students with why they're doing it. And especially with undergrads, grads, adult learners, the, ex, being able to explain the why and linking it, whether it's to the outcomes which may be tied to a future career or, or even an assessment, that's fine. Assessment is part of learning. We need to be able to see where people are at. So explaining the why is really important as well as the what in that case. So you demystified it, that it's, this is its purpose, but it's the reason why we're doing it is because of this as well. And then how are you seeing, um, I wanted to just, you know, give, you know, emphasize that point because I think it's really important. I think too often we're integrating technology into our courses and we have a why in mind uh, or not. And, and ultimately it's not translating or there's miscommunications and something that could have been useful in terms of, like you say, translating a human to human previous interaction or experience into a an online one gets lost in translation. And I think a lot of that happened too during the pandemic when we went to emergency remote learning. I think technology has gotten such a bad rep reputation because it was so haphazardly ad hoc um, added to so many courses and learning experiences. Um, yeah, what do you think about that? Well, right. Um, so the, yeah, it's a learning experience, right? So good learning experiences are, can come from a place of kind of eureka moment from an instructor and he's going to have a great idea and do this. But quite often, or they've taken it from something, somebody else and they've learned it, but quite often these and so they just modeled it out in the same way. But quite often, you need to design a learning experience. So I think the other, with technology and online learning or hybrid learning or the application of technology through LMSs to support in-class learning, this is relatively extremely new, right? I mean, even from the 80s, but for most people, it's really from the late 90s and many more. It's even very much more recent than that. So even the ways of thinking through technology and learning in, sort of, in terms of digital technologies in that sense, that's a massive research area that is extremely important. Is the area I studied, actually. So it's still new. Like we can't do everything all at one go. And because people are being asked to create this kind of stuff en masse and there's an expe expectation to, one of the first places people go to is their own experience. So they think about the way that they've been teaching before or the way they've seen people teaching before. And then that's how they then construct the online learning experience. So that chat discussion becomes something like, please talk together in small groups about X, Y, and Z. 
but you're not providing a neat framework for it. You're not necessarily sort of already previously defining groups that they should work in with a specific goal in mind that maybe counteracts a kind of something. So you could have two groups that you purposely ask to disagree on something, for mm. example. And but really it's poor design quite often. Mm. And but because it's such a new field, really good versions of it are they're definitely out there. But really good versions of it in many people's eyes are the ones full of bells and whistles and mm -hmm. animations and audio. But there's a lot of stuff in in like multimedia learning that that could be interfering with the actually cognitive acquisition of the content as well. So it really is, I think, again, it's not doesn't have to be as complicated as you think. Ask yourself, demystify, ask yourself, what is it you're trying to do? And then look at the technology you've got in technologies you've probably got in front of you to do it and then remember that one of those technologies is the no technology option mm. so it might not be as good as the no technology option just go for that mm. it could be synchronous live through the zoom chat that could be the easiest way of doing it or if you really have to do it asynchronously ask yourself you know again demystify it level well, what am i really trying to do here and what how would i do it in a in a if I was in front of somebody, how can I translate that when there's that kind of distance between um, distance between the people? No, and I really it resonates in the work that I do and in the conversations that that we have with our colleagues. This idea of a principled approach. So there are principles with which you're you're making decisions, and it's also a process based approach. So it's not about getting it right and knowing it's perfect. It's about Having a having a set of principles that you're trying to embody in the design phase, and uh, you develop a course with that spirit. You deliver it. You see what kind of feedback you get from students, what works, what doesn't work, and you then iterate into the the, the next design phase. So, if we could just uh, double click on this principled approach for a second, yeah. what are the things? I mean, I think you've mentioned something. This this social. So, if you said, let's get try to get specific. If in this moment you were going to offer people a set of principles by which they could look at um, designing a technology enhanced learning experience, one of the ones I would say you've already mentioned is the fact that it should be social in nature. It should be some in some way it should involve interaction, whether that's interaction with me as an instructor, with the content, with peers in particular, though, I feel like you you understand or you would you would emphasize this learner to learner kind of social interaction is that fair as as a principle that you would use yeah definitely because you're inevitably again is it is are you with a group of students studying for like four weeks 12 weeks 16 weeks or a year together as a cohort or even disparate members then yeah that peer interaction is really important but in some programs it might be you should diving in and diving out to pick up specific aspects of it to learn, like in compliance training and things like that, then the peer stuff is not as relevant there necessarily. It's the context. What are you trying to achieve again? Mm. So, and then uh, to what extent is the peer the peer interaction necessary? And the peer interaction can be the teacher being the peer as well, as the students can be the teacher as well. So there's different interaction patterns that you can create. So don't always think it's chalk and talk in that sense. Um, sage on the stage, rather, you know, is what I mean, actually. Yeah, so that's interesting. So, I mean, I'm trying to give them tangible anchors to hold on to here, Stephen, but you're right. You're kind of like, the principles have to be set by the person in the context. Like, I don't know what you're trying to do, but let's, okay, let's try to get some general ones. Like, it would, because <laughs> you're true. I, on, into this tech, okay, but go ahead. But the, uh, one thing, actually, Michelle, is, You've been through it. You've, you've been trained as an educator, and I have too. One of the things that they quite early on in, in your training is they get you to think about your personal principles of how you like your philosophy education. Right. I nail you, get you to think through carefully. Yeah. So they you like, write 10 statements that define your personal view of education, yeah. right? And often those 10 statements, if I'd looked at my 10 statements from 10 years ago, I'll bet you three quarters are different now. Already. Okay, well, here's what we're going to do, Stephen. This is how we're going to close it out. I want you 
to oh, think no. of, and, and, I, and I, I, we can go, we can go one at a time. But the, let's share three statements, three statements that we feel hold true in terms of the design. <coughs> they don't have to be perfect, <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll remember it's not. It's about iteration, right? But generally speaking. If given our positions, our expertise, our experiences in, in, in the world of education to date, the evolving from our original philosophies of teaching and learning in the early days of our own teacher education, given the uncertainty, the multiple level of uncertainties that you just talked about, environmental, economic, geopolitical that we're facing, in the world of teaching and learning, if we wanted to design, because I think nowadays technology enhanced teaching and learning is not, it's its not an if, it's a, you know, we're all teaching some level of technology enhanced, to your point, whatever version or level of that exists. What are the kinds of principles vis-a-vis -vis statements that we would give uh, instructional designers, instructors who are designing their courses and not instructional designers, um, in terms of that. Okay. I, I, I preambled there for a good two minutes, right? I've, I've, re I've brainstormed three quick. <laughs> uh, actually not I did it. I ambled for you. Okay. Go not, for it. You did a good job. They're, <laughs> doing that. they're not made up either. These are actually what generally what <laughs> they're kind of paraphrasing in to some degree, but I'm going to give you the first one. Um, networked. And I don't mean like internet network. I mean, the learning should be somehow beyond the scope of the bounds of the course or the technology that you're utilizing to for that instructional purpose. So how can you expand the learning beyond in order to make for, for the learners to make connections with other things they've learned before? other things they may learn in the future, other sources, spaces, and uh, sites of information and data, whether that be a real library or an online library or another course that they've done um, or another student that they're working with or somebody they worked with before or even an organisation. They could look at like the UN, for example, and what they're learning resources there. So encourage if you're a learning designer and try and think about not just that micro course with that context in that place. Try and build it on a foundation of networked mm. as well as you can. So that's one thing. I like it. My second one in that is provide options. So quite frequently, there's one form of assessment, a one mm. assessment. Quite frequently, there's one set of content with a text that gets to the end point. With technology, with AI, with chat GPT, you could like literally like ask it for anything and it'll find different content for you that you can work with on the fly. So stop limiting it to single text, single audio. The, in some cases, there may be an expert who's got a brilliant video that it's so foundational that you need to know it, right? That's fine. The instructor has that field knowledge to be able to define that. So the SME should be able to say that to the designer. But by and large, the system should, the, the technology should be designed to provide options and not mm -hmm. students in into some kind of walk garden. I like that one too. It connects to your previous comment around personalization, because I think when you give students options, especially around assessments, because those are high risk spaces, right, for students. So if I'm all of a sudden able to make more autonomous decisions about how I'm going to demonstrate my learning to you, then there is a is this intrinsic owner, more increased ownership of learning. So I love that idea of so networked learning outside the boundaries of the classroom personalized learning through options afforded within the course experience. Okay, number three. Yeah, I'll just add to the options as well. I mean, it's it behooves us to do this because we we need, AODA is a requirement in Ontario and also diversity and inclusion. You need to think of options yeah. for different types of learners. So that should be the, the very beginning of what you're doing. You have to do that. Mm. But it just mean giving them three different types of essay in different contexts. It's literally a student can find their own text that they want to learn through. Yeah. My third one is reinforce. It's mm -hmm. just an age old thing. Old school. You're going old school for number three. Right, but it's also actually you don't see a lot of it. So if you take an online course, it's like it's 
it's a bit lockstep. You start A and you finish at Z and you don't really go A, B, C, D. And then often you don't go back to B again. You just keep going through. Yeah, it's so true. You have load issue and uh, over the course and like people at the end of the course, you bet you might not even remember what you did at the beginning of it in 16 weeks, 13 weeks semester, let's say. So to what extent are you reinforcing? And reinforcing doesn't mean going over the same input again, it means addressing the input in a different way to maybe attack different sort of cognitive abilities or or needs, for example. So one point of the, the initial input, maybe early on, it may be text-based, let's say, with something you have to address with it. But later on, it could be a problem that reinforces that, that the students have to solve together, that refer makes them refer back to that. So there's not enough of reinforcement going on in a lot of learning. And I think it's essential. Humans are actually terrible learners. Yes, we need reinforcement. I was going to say it's that it's the you're 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 preaching to the choir here from a neurobiological standpoint. Like you have to groove that pathway in your brain. If you're making new connections, you can't just travel along that road once. You need to travel along it in multiple different ways, in multiple different cars, at going multiple speeds, and you know all the kinds of things that you're talking about. And what's beautiful is that it actually really connects to your first two because network learning opportunities are opportunities to reinforce, providing options for personalized uh, learning pathways, again, could be an opportunity to reinforce learning. And no, this is great. I, you know, I, 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 I knew you could do it, Stephen. I knew you could do it. And you were. <laughs> I think I just one other thing, because again, with network learning, there's a lot of kind of terms that things, there's, there's a notion of nodes, right? And a node may be the core sort of area. It, let's, we, you could call it the core area that you need to know, but you're drifting off into lots of other ways to apply it in different ways. But coming back to that node again is the reinforcement. To, it's the ground that you're standing on, that you don't want to be moving too much under your feet. It's the space where students can feel comfortable and that maybe the main, the, the summative assessment could be based on somehow or another, if that's a requirement. Well, and the reinforcement really reminds me of the importance of formative assessment, which we don't, which now again is having a resurgence. Now, in this whole revolution of education and some of these skill sets that folks are looking to build. And again, we're starting to recognize the need for these three statements to be embodied that, that you've shared with us today. Um, these continuous lower risk assessments, how to make those again, uh, meaningful and purposeful in terms of reinforcement. I, I, I am so grateful for the insights you've been able to share in this short time, Stephen. There are a multitude of other things I meant to talk to you about, which we did not get to. So you're going to have to come back on to... Yes, I don't even mean to be. <laughs> yes, you're going to have to come back on to the program so that we can dive into some of these topics. But I, I as I as I knew your your um, wealth of experience and expertise, not just because you've been going to school since the 70s, but uh, <laughs> your incredibly diverse portfolio is is not only impressive, but it's also really insightful. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share some of your insights here today. And like I say, you're going to have to come back on, Stephen. So um, get ready, 2024. We'll have you back on. Thank you very much, Michelle. Have an awesome evening. It's been fantastic talking to you. The Education Revolution podcast is produced in-house by community members. And I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Sangara. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and head over to my website to opt in for my newsletter for more ways to connect with some of these big ideas.